Hello and welcome back to the channel Science, Maths and Engineering. Today we are going to solve the Assam Public Service Commission's Inland Water Transport Paper of 2021. This is the Mechanical Engineering Paper for the post of Assistant Engineer. So let's get started. In a slider crank mechanism, there are A, 3 links, B, 4 links, C, 5 links or D, none of the above. So the answer is, it has 4 links. So next question. The component of acceleration parallel to the link is called radial, tangential, coriolis or absolute. So the answer is, it is called radial or centripetal acceleration. So the component of acceleration parallel to the link is called radial or centripetal acceleration. Next. In a journal bearing, the load acting on the shaft is A, axial, B, coaxial, C, transverse to its axis or D, inclined to its axis. So the answer is... In a general bearing, the load acting on the shaft is transverse to its axis or in the radial direction. Next, a screw and nut will be self-locking if efficiency is A, more than 50%, B, equal to 50%, C, less than 50% or D, equal to that for overhauling. So, the answer is, a screw and nut will be self-locking if efficiency is less than 50%, C, we have this formula, efficiency is less than or equal to 1 by 2 minus 10 square phi by 2. Now, phi is the friction angle. So, so as 10 square phi, phi is positive, 10 square phi is also positive. So, our efficiency would be less than 50%. Next, the size of gear is usually specified by A, diametral pitch, B, pressure angle, C, circular pitch or D, the pitch circle diameter. So, the answer is... The size of a gear is usually specified by the pitch circle diameter. Next, hour hand and minute hand are connected in a clock mechanism by means of a simple gear train, b epicyclic gear train, c reverted gear train or d none of the above. So the answer is the hour hand and the minute hand are connected in a clock mechanism by means of the reverted gear train. Now what is the reverted gear train? Where the First gear and the last gear are coaxial. So here the hour hand and the minute hands are coaxial. Next, the surface of the gear tooth below the pitch surface is called A face width, B face, C tooth space or D flank. So the answer is it is called flank. So this is the diagram you see. So this middle line is the pitch circle diameter and so pitch circle is this one and the diameter is pitch circle diameter and so Below this, this is the tooth of the, this is called flank. And above it, it would be face, okay. So, next question. The partial balancing means, A, best balancing of engines, B, balancing of engines, C, balancing partially the reciprocating masses, or D, all of the above. So, the answer is, the partial balancing means, balancing partially the reciprocating masses. Next. The gyroscopic effects due to, Rotating parts of a turbojet engine of an aircraft on a curved course depends on A. Flight velocity B. Flight altitude C. Radius of the curve or D. Flight velocity and radius of the curve. So the answer is the gyroscopic effect due to the rotating parts of a turbojet engine of an aircraft on a curved course depends on the flight velocity and the radius of the curve. Next. A cam mechanism imparts A. Rotating motion, B. Oscillating motion, C. Reciprocating motion, or D. All of the above. So the answer is a cam mechanism imparts reciprocating motion. Next, a file moves the a file removes the metal during a return stroke, B. Forward stroke, C. Both forward and return strokes, or D. None of the above. So the answer is a file removes the metal during forward stroke and the file can be lifted off the work during the return stroke as there is no cutting action. Next, in a centrifugal casting method, A, core is made of sand, B, core is made of ferrous material, C, core is made of non-ferrous material or D, no core is used. So the answer is in a centrifugal casting, no core is used. Next, in which of the following operations, motion of job is rotary and motion of cutting tool is forward okay so the job is rotating okay but the cutting tool is just going forward so the answer is it is the turning operation so the turning operation that we do in lathe the 
uh, the job is rotating and the cutting tool is going forward next which of the following is an example of multi cutting tool a milling cutter b broaching tool c both milling cutter and broaching tool or d none of the above so the answer is both milling cutter and broaching tools are examples of multi point cutting tools next the carbide tool operating at very low cutting speeds that is below 30 meter per minute a reduces tool life b increases tool life have no effect on tool life or d spoils the workpiece so the answer is it reduces the tool life okay next high speed steel tools retain the hardness up to a temperature of a 250 degree centigrade b 350 degree centigrade c 500 degree centigrade or d 900 degree centigrade so the answer is it retains up to 900 degree centigrade and however in most high speed tool a maximum temperature up to 650 degree is taken as the working range okay so working range is still 650 but it can still retain its hardness up to 900 degree centigrade so next in a cutting tool abrasion and adhesion are primarily responsible for a crater wear b plastic deformation c flank wear or d mechanical breakage so the answer is so in a cutting tool abrasion and adhesion are primary responsible for flank wear next for a single point cutting tool the continuous chip with built up edge is formed due to a stronger adhesion between chips and tool face b low rack angle c large uncut thickness or d all of the above so the answer is See, for a single point cutting tool, the continuous chip with build up edge is formed due to stronger adhesion between the chip and the tool face, low cutting speed, excessive feed or large uncut thickness, small rack angle and lack of lubricant. So, option D, that is all of the above is the correct answer. Next, tool life is most affected by machine, A, cutting speed, B, tool geometry, C, feed and depth or D, microstructure of material being cut. So, the answer is tool life is most affected by machine cutting speed and for that we have the Taylor tool life equation which gives that V into T to the power N is equal to constant where V is the cutting speed and T is the tool life okay and C is the constant so next question the reasons for necessity of testing C waste are A to recommend the type of treatment to be adopted for the particular type of sewage b to know the specific gravity of sewage c to know the sulfur cycle or d none of the above so the answer is the reason for treatment of testing of sewage is to recommend the type of testing to, to be adopted for the particular type of sewage next the physical impurity like turbidity in water can be measured by a turbidity rod b Jackson turbidimeter c bailey's turbidimeter or d all of the above so, the physical impurity like turbidity in water can be measured by turbidity rod, Jackson's turbidimeter, Bailey's turbidimeter, turbidimeter or nephelometer. So, our all of the above is the correct option. Next, salient features of water supply schemes are A. Population forecast and record of in industry. B. Assessment of water demand and record of public place. C quality and sources of water or d all of the above so the answer is salient features of water supply schemes are population forecast and record of industry assessment of water demand and record of public places and quality of uh, quality and sources of water etc so all of the above is the correct answer next the viscosity of a liquid increases with temperature b gases increases with temperature c fluid decreases with temperature or d none of the above so the answer is the viscosity of gases increases with temperature and the viscosity of liquids decreases with temperature okay so next Borden gauge measures a absolute pressure b gauge pressure c local atmospheric pressure or d standard atmospheric pressure so the answer is Borden gas measures gas pressure. Next, a body floating in a liquid is said to be in neutral equilibrium if its metacenter A coincides with its 
center of gravity b lies above its center of gravity c lies below its center of gravity or d none of the above so the answer is a body floating in a liquid is said to be in neutral equilibrium if its meta center coincides with the center of gravity now these are the conditions for stable equilibrium unstable equilibrium and neutral equilibrium and when the body is floating or it is fully submerged so our body is floating here and it is in neutral equilibrium so our meta center and the center of gravity coincides so next question a flow is said to be rotational when a the streamlines are curved b a velocity gradient in the normal direction of flow exists c every fluid element has finite angular velocity about its mass center or d none of the above so the answer is a flow is said to be rotational if the fluid particles while moving in the direction of flow rotate about their mass centers so next vorticity is a 2 times the rotation b 1.5 times the rotation c 3 times the rotation or d equal to rotation so the answer is vorticity is 2 times the rotation okay so vorticity or circulation per unit area is equal to twice the rotation component about an axis perpendicular to the plane in which the area is lying so next the dryness fraction that is x of superheated steam is taken as so it is taken as x equal to 1 next total energy of the universe a is always increasing b is always decreasing c either increases or decreases or d is always constant the answer is the total energy of the universe is always constant next what is the state at which saturated liquid line with respect to vaporization and saturated vapor line on PV diagram of pure substance made called okay so is it the saturation state is it the critical state is it the vaporization state or is it the superheated vapor state so the answer is it is known as the critical state okay so here Vf would be equal to Vfz Okay. So, this is the liquid region, this is the saturated liquid line and this is the saturated vapor line. So, saturate the state at which the saturated liquid line with respect to vaporization and the saturated vapor line on the PV diagram are made. So, it is the critical state. Okay. So, next question. Gas turbines are suitable for aircraft propulsion because A gas turbines are lightweight b gas turbines are compact in size c gas turbines have a hover high power to weight ratio or d all of the above so the answer is all of the above that is gas turbines are suitable for aircraft propulsion because gas turbines are lightweight they are compact in size and gas turbines are having high power to weight ratio next carnot cycle contains two reversible adiabatic processes and a two reversible isentropic processes b two reversible isobaric processes c two reversible isochoric processes or d two reversible isothermal processes so the answer is carnot cycle contains two reversible adiabatic processes and two reversible isothermal processes so we have an isothermal expansion we have an adiabatic expansion, we have an isothermal compression and we have a diabetic compression. Okay. So next question. When the potential gradient in a process in is infinitesimal or zero, what will be the change in entropy of the universe? So the answer is when the potential gradient is a process in a process is infinitesimal or zero then there is no change in entropy of the universe. Next question. Bernoulli's theorem deals with the law of conservation of A mass, B momentum, C energy or D none of the above. So the answer is Bernoulli's theorem deals with the law of conservation of energy. Next. The flow of a fluid is laminar when A. 
the fluid is viscous b the reynolds number is less than 2000 c the velocity is more than the critical velocity or d the fluid is ideal so the answer is the fluid flow of a fluid is laminar when the reynolds number is less than 2000 okay and this actually basically means that we are having a pipe flow because in opal channel it, we can have a, a laminar flow at a little higher values of Reynolds number. Okay. Okay. In a laminar boundary layer, the nom nominal thickness varies with the longitudinal distance x as a x to the power minus half b x to the power minus 1 by 5 c x or d x to the power half. So the answer is c in a laminar uh, boundary layer the nominal thickness varies with the longitudinal distance x s x to the power half now see how we get it we we'll see from glacier's equation we have delta by x is equal to 5 by root over r e x so which is equal to 5 divided by r e x would be p into x divided by nu so from here we get delta is equal to 5 into root over x into nu divided by p. So, our delta is directly proportional to root over x. So, delta is directly proportional to x to the power half. Next. The gas constant R is equal to A, sum of two specific heats, B, difference of two specific heats, C, product of two specific heats, or D, ratio of two specific heats. So, the answer is the gas constant R is equal to difference of two specific heats that is R is equal to Cp minus Cv. Next. Kelvin-Planck law deals with A. Conservation of energy B. Conservation of heat C. Conservation of mass or D. Conversion of heat into work. So the answer is Kelvin-Planck law deals with conversion of heat into work. So the Kelvin-Planck statement is that it is impossible to construct an engine which while operating in a cycle produces no other effect except to extract heat from a single reservoir and do equivalent amount of work. Okay, so it deals with the conversion of heat into work. Next, during throttling process, A, internal energy does not change, B, pressure does not change, C, Entropy does not change or D. Enthalpy does not change. So the answer is during throttling process, enthalpy does not change. Next. Economizer in the boiler heats the A. Steam. B. Air. C. Feed water or D. Coal. So the answer is an economizer is a device which the in which the waste heat of the flue gases is utilized. For heating the feed water so it heats the feed water this is used to reduce the fuel consumption so next the internal energy of a gas is a function of temperature which of the following names is associated with the above law a joule b salts c boil or d delton so the answer is it is joule's law which states that the internal energy of a perfect gas is a function of the absolute temperature only. So next, heat flows from hot substance to cold substance unaided. This, the name associated with the above statement is A. Clausius, B. Joule, C. Planck, or D. Kelvin. So the answer is the this statement is associated with Clausius. That is, heat flows from a hot substance to cold substance unaided. Next, which law of thermodynamics expresses that the energy is always conserved quantity wise? A. First law, B. Second law, C. Third law, or D. None of the above. So the answer is, it is the first law of thermodynamics which expresses that the energy is always conserved quantity wise. So next, Vacuum pressure is defined as pressure A. Below the atmospheric pressure B. Above the atmospheric pressure C. Between the atmospheric pressure and gas pressure or D. Above the absolute pressure. So the answer is vacuum pressure is defined as the pressure below the atmospheric pressure. 
next a rivet is specified as a 20 millimeter rivet what does it mean a head diameter is 20 millimeter b tank diameter is 20 millimeter c both head dia and tank dia are 20 millimeter or d none of the above so the answer is a rivet is specified by the tank diameter of the rivet so 20 millimeter rivet means a rivet having 20 millimeter as the tank diameter next if a fastener is threaded into a tapped hole, then the fastener is likely to be called as A. Screw B. Bolt C. Washer or D. Screw or Bolt So the answer is If a fastener is threaded into a tapped hole, then the fastener is likely to be called a screw Next Which type of joints is better when the product is subjected to large variations is it the welded joint or the threaded joint okay or both have same results or depends on the magnitude of the vibrational force so the answer is actually neither threaded nor welded joints are good when subjected to large vibrations however what happens is that threaded joints loosen due to vibrations and thus among threaded joints and welded joints welded joint is better okay now in this kind of situations a riveted joint is ideal and jam nut castle nut split nut etc also can be used with threaded bolt for this vibrating condition so that the so that the nut and the bolt doesn't come out of the joint and uh, the um, joint would be broken right so if we can use this kind of nuts then we can use uh, threaded uh, tra threaded joints otherwise welding joint is better among these two next if there is no place to accommodate the nut then one would choose the a true balls b tap balls c touch or d none of the above the answer is if there is no place to accommodate the nut then tap balls should be used okay next the property of a material by virtue of which it can be beaten or rolled into plates is called a malleability b ductility c plasticity or d elasticity so the answer is the property of a material by virtue of which it can be beaten or rolled into plates is called malleability. Next, the assumptions made in Euler's column theory is that A. The failure of column occurs due to buckling alone. B. The length of column is very large as compared to its cross-sectional dimensions. C. The column material obeys Hooke's law. Or D. All of the above. So the answer is all of the above that is the assumptions made in Euler's column theory are that the failure of the column occurs due to buckling alone the length of the column is very large as compared to its cross-sectional dimensions and the column material of a hook's law okay so next the bending stress in a beam is dash sectional modulus a inversely proportional to two times sectional modulus directly proportional to sectional, sectional modulus C inversely proportional to section modulus or D none of the above. So the answer is C the section modulus Z is given by Z is equal to I by Y. Now we know M by sigma is equal to I by Y. So because Z is M by sigma, right? Then so from here Z is equal to M by sigma. So we get sigma is equal to M by Z. Now, for a constant M, sigma is directly proportional to 1 by Z. So, bending stress in a beam is inversely proportional to section modulus. Next, modulus of rigidity is defined as the ratio of A, longitudinal stress to longitudinal strain, B, volumetric stress to volumetric strain, C, lateral stress to lateral strain, or D, shear stress to shear strain. So, the answer is... 
modulus of rigidity is the ratio of shear stress to shear strain. So it is denoted by Z, capital Z. Next. When two plates are butt together and riveted with cover plates with two rows of rivets, the joint is known as A, lap joint, B, butt joint, C, single riveted, single cover butt joint, or D, double riveted, double cover butt joint. So the answer is, it is called double riveted, double cover butt joint, C. These are the double riveted, double cover butt joints. This is the chain pattern and this is the jigsaw, zigzag pattern, right? And then here we have uh, two rows of rivet and it is having double cover because it is riveted with cover plate. So both sides this is covered. So it is called double riveted, double cover, but joint. Okay. Next. The accuracy of micrometers, calipers, dial indicators can be checked by A. Filler gaze, B. Slip gaze, C. Ring gaze or D. Plug gaze. So the answer is, they can be checked by slip gauges. Okay. Next. A flat surface can be produced by a lathe machine if the cutting tool moves A. Parallel to the axis of rotation of workpiece. Perpendicular to the axis of rotation of workpiece, C at an angle of 45 degree or D none of the above. So the answer is a flat surface can be produced by a lathe machine if the cutting tool moves perpendicular to the axis of rotation of workpiece. It is also known as facing operation. Next, the device used to generate power utilizing energy of wind is A air motor. B. Aero generator, C. Windmill or D. Wind generator. So the answer is, so it is actually wind generator. So next up. Solar cells are made of A. Silica, B. Steel, C. Sulfur or D. Antimony. So the answer is, they are made of silica. Next. Boiling water reactor and pressurized water reactor are a. Nuclear reactors, B. Solar reactors, C. OTEC or D. Biogas reactors. So the answer is they are nuclear reactors. Next. Lignite, bituminous, anthracite are types of A. Nuclear fuels, B. Coal, C. Natural gas or D. Biogas. So they are types of coal. We have peat, lignite, bituminous, and anthracite. Next, depletion of the ozone layer is damaging to human health. Negative effects include A, skin cancer, B, osteoporosis, C, dyspepsia or D, AIDS. So the answer is, depletion of ozone layer is damaging to human health. Negative effects include skin cancer. Okay? Because the ultraviolet rays can now enter our Earth's atmosphere at a much higher level because the ozone layer is depleting. So, this ultraviolet uh, rays can cause skin cancer. Next, greenhouse gases are those that absorb and emit infrared radiation. Examples include A. Nitrogen, B. Oxygen, C. Argon or D. Carbon dioxide. So the answer is C. Carbon dioxide is the major greenhouse gas. So, greenhouse gases are those which absorb and emit infrared radiation. Now, these examples include carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons, etc. Now, ozone is also a minor greenhouse gas. Now, so our answer is carbon dioxide D, but uh, according to APSC, it is ozone, but it is actually not correct because ozone is a minor greenhouse gas, whereas carbon dioxide is a major greenhouse gas. Next. Cosmic rays such as gamma rays are a source of A. Soil pollution, B. Noise pollution, C. Thermal pollution or D. Radiation pollution. So the answer is cosmic rays such as gamma rays are a source of radiation pollution. Next. The ratio of circumferential stress to longitudinal stress 
in a thin cylinder subjected to internal hydrostatic pressure is A 1 by 2, B 1, C 2 and D 4. So, the answer is for a thin cylinder you see circumferential stress is T D by 2 T and longitudinal stress is P D by 4 D. So, our ratio of circumferential stress to longitudinal stress would be equal to 2. Okay. So, next. For a maximum bending moment, shear force at this section should be A 0, B maximum, C minimum or D none of the above. So, the answer is it would be 0. See, our shear force is equal to dm by dx. Now, as m is maximum, so our f would be equal to 0. Next, a beam of uniform strength is one which has a bending moment throughout this section, which has the same bending moment throughout this section or which has the same shearing force throughout this section or same deflection throughout this section or same bending or the bending stress is constant at every section. Okay. So, the answer is a beam of uniform strength is one which has same maximum bending stress constant at every section along the length. Okay. Next question. Principal strains occur on three planes which are A. Inclined to each other at 45 degree. B. Mutually perpendicular to each other. C. Inclined to each other at 22 half degree. And D. None of the above. So, the answer is principal strains occur on three planes which are mutually perpendicular to each other. Next. The resultant deflection of a beam under symmetrical bending is A. Perpendicular to the neutral axis, B. Parallel to the axis of symmetry, C. Perpendicular to the axis of symmetry, or D. Parallel to the neutral axis. So, the answer is the resultant deflection of a beam under symmetrical bending is perpendicular to the neutral axis. Next, a key made from a cylindrical disc having angular segmental cross section is known as A. Udraf key, B. Feather key, C. Gib head key, or D. Tangent key. So the answer is it is at Udraf key. Okay, next. In a steam engine, the piston rod is usually connected to the cross head by means of a A. Knuckle joint. B. Universal joint. C. Flange joint or D. Quarter joint. So, the answer is they are connected by means of a quarter joint. Next. The center to center distance between two consecutive rivets in a row is called A. Margin. B. Pits. C. Back pits or D. Diagonal pits. So, the answer is it is known as pitch. See, center to center distance. Okay. Between two consecutive rivets in a row. Okay. Between two consecutive rivets in a row. So, they are known as pits. Okay. The distance known as pitch. So, next question. The product of the diametral pits and circular pits is equal to A1, B, 1 by pi, C, pi or D pi into number of teeth. So, the answer is, see, diametral pits is expressed as the number of teeth per unit pit circle diameter. So, P is equal to Z by D, where Z is the number of teeth and small d is the pit circle diameter. Now, circular pits, it is the distance measured along the circumference of the pit circle from a point on one tooth to corresponding point on the adjacent tooth. So, our small p would be equal to pi d by z. So, our diametral pits and circular pits, their product would be equal to pi. Okay. So, z by d into pi d by z, so it is pi. So, option c. Next. A spring used to absorb shocks and vibration is A. Deep spring B. Torsion spring C. Disc spring 
or the conical spring? So the answer is it is a leaf spring and that is why it is widely used in automobiles. Okay, next. If a truss consists of 8 joints, 10 members and 4 reaction components, then it is a a cantilever truss, B efficient truss, C redundant truss or D none of the above. So the answer is C N is equal to 10, J is equal to 8 and R is equal to 4. Now therefore 2J minus R would be equal to 12. Now our N is 10 and it is less than 2J minus R. So this truss is a deficient truss. Okay. Now, had that this both been equal, then it would have been a perfect truss. Next. The radius of curvature of trajectory for a projectile is minimum if A. Velocity is minimum. B. Acceleration is maximum. C. Both A and B or D. None of the above. Okay. So, C. The radius of curvature of a trajectory for a projectile at any instant is given by r is equal to u square cos square alpha divided by z into cos cube theta. Now, the velocity instantaneous velocity is given by v is equal to u cos alpha divided by cos theta, okay, where u is the initial velocity of the projectile, alpha is the angle of projection and z is the acceleration due to gravity and theta is the angle made by the projectile with the horizontal at that instant. Okay. Now, as our u, alpha and z do not change with the motion, so our radius of curvature r would be directly proportional to 1 by cos cube theta. Okay. So, r is minimum when the cos theta is maximum. Now, cos theta is maximum when cos theta is equal to 1. So, cos theta is 1 then theta would be equal to 0 degree thus our r is minimum when the projectile reaches the maximum height because that at that time only theta would be 0 degree okay now at this instant the velocity of the projectile is also minimum because we have reached the maximum height so velocity is minimum right now velocity is given by v is equal to u cos alpha by cos theta now theta is 0, so our V is equal to U cos alpha. Okay. The acceleration is again constant throughout and is equal to Z, that is the acceleration due to gravity. Okay. So our answer is A that, that the radius of curvature of trajectory for a projectile is minimum when the velocity is minimum. Okay. So next question. Verigdan's theorem is used to find a direction of resultant force, b location of the resultant force, c magnitude of the resultant force, or d nature of the resultant force. So the answer is c. Verigdan's theorem is used to find the location of the resultant force. Okay, and what is Verigdan's uh, theorem? It states that the moment of a force about any point is equal to the Algebraic sum of the moments of its components about the same point. Okay, so next. The mechanical advantage of a lifting machine is the ratio of A. Distance moved by effort to the distance moved by load. B. Load lifted to the effort lift applied. C. Output to input or D. All of the above. So the answer is. Mechanical advantage of a lifting machine is the ratio of the load lifted to the effort applied. The forces which, which meet at one point and their lines of action also lie on the same plane are known as A. Coplanar concurrent forces B. Coplanar non-concurrent forces C. Non-coplanar concurrent forces or D. Non-coplanar non-concurrent forces So the answer is the forces meet at a point, so they are concurrent, and the line of action also lie in the same plane, so they are coplanar. So this would be coplanar concurrent forces. Next, the continuous deformation of a metal under a steady load is called a creep, b fatigue, c corrosion, or d none of the above. 
So the answer is it is called creep. Next, the boundary between alpha and alpha plus beta regions is called A liquidus, B solidus, C solvus, or D none of the above. So the answer is see, it is known as solvus. So this is the general guide. If the boundary between liquid and liquid plus alpha region, it is the liquidus one. Liquidus then boundary between L and L plus beta region would be again liquidus. Boundary between alpha and L plus alpha, this is solidus. Boundary between beta and L plus beta, this is again solidus. Then boundary between alpha and alpha plus beta, that is solvus. And boundary between beta and alpha plus beta region, it is also solvus. Okay. So next. The reaction that on heating one solid phase yields another solid phase plus one liquid phase is called. So it is called what? It is called peritectic reaction. So see when we heat, we have a solid alpha to a sol solid beta plus a liquid. And when cooling, we get a liquid plus a solid that is L plus beta gives us a another solid that is alpha. Okay, next question. In a tensile test, necking starts at A, lower yield point, B, upper yield point, C, ultimate tensile stress, or D, none of the above. So the answer is necking starts at ultimate, ultimate tensile stress. Next. According to Hooke's law, when a material is loaded within its elastic limit, the stress is A, directly proportional to the strain. B. Inversely proportional to the string. C. Proportional to the square of the string. Or D. Proportional to the inverse of the square of the string. So the answer is it is directly proportional to strain. So stress is directly proportional to strain. Okay. But within elastic limit. Okay. Next. Hardness is A. The property of a material due to which it is able to resist. Abrasion, indentation, and sketching. B. The susceptibility of a material to get hardened. C. The same as hardenability. Or D. None of the above. So the answer is hardness is the property of a material due to which it is able to resist abrasion, indentation, and scratching. Next. A cation vacancy and an anion vacancy in a crystal of the type AB is called. So it is called Schottky effect. Next, the hardness of martensite in a steel is a function of A. Cooling rate, B. Nickel content, C. Carbon content, or D. Nose location. So the answer is the hardness of a martensite is a function of its carbon content. Okay. It increases rapidly with increasing carbon content, reaching a more or less constant value of 65 on the Rockwell scale at about 0.6% carbon. Next, cup and cone fracture is observed in the fracture of A, brittle material, B, ductile material, C, advanced ceramic material or D, none of the above. So the answer is cup and cone fracture is observed in the fracture of ductile materials. Next, the failure that happens due to cyclic loading is called, so it is called fatigue failure. Next, which of the following welding processes uses consumable electrodes? Okay, so the answer is a MIG, that is a metal inert gas, uses consumable electrode of the given different types. Okay, so it uses 100% carbon dioxide sealed gas that protects itself from oxidation. Okay, so next, the most commonly used flame in gas welding is. So it is a neutral flame. Next. Steam welding is A. Multi-spot welding process. B. Continuous spot welding process. C. Used to form mass. Or D. Used for welding cylindrical objects. So the answer is steam welding is continuous spot welding process. Next. Submerged arc welding is A. A process which uses a mixture of iron oxide and granular aluminium b 
accomplished by maintaining a hot molten metal pool between plates c a process in which arc is maintained under a blanket of flux or d all of the above so the answer is submerged arc welding uses a mass of fusible granular flux and the arc is maintained underneath it the flux contains calcium oxide calcium fluoride and silica and is sintered to form a coarse powder this granular flux is spread over the joint to be made and the consumable electrode is fed into the flux a portion of the flux melts to protect the liquid wool weld pool while the rest of the flux seals the arc okay so option c that is a process in which the arc is maintained under a blanket of flux is the correct option so next the process used to finish work pieces with high surface quality accuracy of shape and dimension is called so it is known as grinding next in mlt theta system the dimension of thermal conductivity is so the answer is c thermal conductivity is what per meter kelvin so when we divide we get it as kg dot meter divided by uh, second cube into Kelvin. So it will be M L T to the power minus 3 and theta to the power minus 1. Next. If K is the thermal conductivity, rho is the mass density and C is the specific heat of a substance, then its thermal diffusivity is so it will be thermal diffusivity alpha is equal to K by root over rho C. Okay. Next. For buoyancy induced fluid flow and thermal and heat transfer, which of the following dimensionless numbers is significant? Reynolds number, Pendle number, Grassoff number, or Nussel number? So the answer is Grassoff number is significant because Grassoff number is equal to buoyancy force divided by viscous force. Okay. So from here we see it is buoyancy induced. So Grassoff number is more significant okay and also heat transfer is going on okay so tw minus t infinity is there okay so next question fins are provided on heat transfer surface a to enhance the heat transfer by increasing the turbulence in flow b to increase the surface area in promoting the rate of heat transfer c to increase the temperature gradient in augmenting heat transfer or d to in decrease the pressure drop of liquids so the answer is fins are provided on heat transfer surface to increase surface area in promoting the rate of heat transfer okay so next which of the following is a property of a fluid a eddy viscosity b eddy diffusivity c kinematic viscosity or d turbulent prendel number so the answer is Kinematic viscosity is a property of a fluid. Okay. Next. In a two fluid heat exchanger, the inlet and outlet temperatures of the hot fluid are 65 degrees centigrade and 40 degrees centigrade res respectively. For the cold fluid, these are 15 degrees centigrade and 43 degrees centigrade respectively. Okay. The heat exchanger is a, so the answer is, see, this is a cross flow heat exchanger because the outlet temperature of hot fluid is 40 degrees centigrade and the outlet temperature of cold fluid is 43 degrees centigrade which is only possible for a counter flow heat exchanger okay next when a steel undergoes a cold work process it becomes progressively softer harder ductile or malleable so the answer is, is it becomes progressively harder due to strain hardening next in a structure the degree or degrees of freedom is or are a1 b2 c infinite or d zero so the answer is it is zero okay so with this we have come to an end to this question paper we try to make it uh, quick so that uh, you can go through more and more question papers in a limited amount of time okay so thank you for watching see you in the next one